Uh, today I'm tasked with uh, talking about pancreatic cysts, which at least in our field, you know, are an ever-increasing phenomenon. Um, I think just having a rudimentary, you know, knowledge of, you know, what they are, uh, what they may represent, what their significance uh, will help because, you know, I, a lot of our inpatient consults as well as outpatient are derived from people getting imaging for any number of reasons, and then these little fluke collections are found, and then the next question is, all right, so what do we do with them? So a quick overview, just do a quick uh, talk about the background. We'll talk about the initial evaluation, what questions you need to ask and sort of sort through to figure out, uh, you know, with the greatest specificity what you're dealing with. Uh, go over the differential diagnosis uh, with a focus on the pancreatic cystic neoplasm. So those are, you know, they do have a pre-malignant, pre-cancerous risk inherent in them. As a result, surgery may be an option for them. So we need to figure out who is at risk for that transformation, who's not, which then impacts who would require surgery or not. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the surveillance guidelines for IPMNs, which are a type of the pancreatic cystic neoplasms, the most common type. Um, I think there's a lot of angst when dealing with these, you know, patients here. So this is potentially precancerous and we're not taking it out, we're not doing anything about it. Similar to say leaving a colon polyp in, it's like take that thing out so it doesn't ever turn into an issue. However, working on the pancreas isn't that easy of a thing. So we need to figure out who truly is at risk, who requires surgery, and then what uh, people can just be sat on and watched. Um, so the we're sort of ever increasing our, our knowledge of these things and unfortunately their prevalence is increasing as well. And that's due to a number of factors. The new most common of which are our imaging techniques are so good at finding these small lesions that we're finding them more and more often as opposed to, you know, in the old days where maybe slices of CTs and MRIs weren't as thin and we weren't finding these smaller things and didn't even know that they were there. The second component of this is they do increase with age. Uh, so, you know, with having an aging population, we are seeing these a lot more commonly. Um, there's one stat that the ACG quotes where individuals 70 and over are going imaging for non-pancreatic reasons, whether it's trauma or something else are actually, you know, 40% are going to be found to have one of these fluid collections. So it's it's not an insignificant thing that we're sort of up against. You know, why do we make such a big difference or a big deal about them? And that's because some, you know, a small percentage can be precancerous, pre-malignant. Um, so we just need to figure out the, to the best of our ability which people those are that may progress so then we can deal with them a little bit more closely. So what do you want to know? Um, you want to know how they present. So what led them to get the imaging that initially found these uh, these cysts. Uh, for the most part, these are asymptomatic people undergoing imaging for other reasons. Um, if I had a nickel for every person that fell off a ladder while cleaning their gutters and then was found to have one of these, I'd be relatively wealthy. You know, it's it's pretty funny the the reasons people get these imaging studies and they come and then you know, we instantly find find these things and they're like, whoa, what is this? Like, how did no one find this before? So you just have to know you know what what their history has been. You also want to know, do they have a history of pancreatitis or anything that would predispose them to pancreatitis because fluid collection in that setting has different ramifications. Is that a pseudocyst? Is that a small pseudocyst that, you know, is this a remnant of prior pancreatitis, um, which, you know, is a benign entity that probably doesn't need to be followed? Do they have a family history of pancreatic cancer, um, which, you know, if someone has a large cyst and, you know, their dad had cancer and their uncle had cancer, you know, that means something a little bit different than if they don't have that history. Lastly, are they someone who has a uh, some sort of syndrome that predisposes to certain types of cysts and then, you know, pancreatic cancer as well? Uh, so von Hippel-Lindau is one of those um, where the tumor suppressor VHL uh, chromosome is mutated. You get all these sort of soft tissue growths or cancers, and you're also predisposed to getting serous cyst adenomas, which we'll sort of talk about uh, later on in the uh, talk. Uh, so evaluation, we already sort of talked about, you know, most of these are picked up with either an MRI or a CT scan. Um, you know, sometimes, and we'll sort of talk about this later, just this, you know, the history and the features of the cyst itself sort of tell you what type it is. It, uh, you know, in, in clinical practice, things are never as cut and dry as that. There's a lot of gray area and, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to do further investigation, further intervention, such as an EOS, steal some tissue or fluid from that, and then have a little bit more information. You can also, you know, check certain labs, depending on how they present. Is there concern for pancreatitis? Do they actually present with jaundice from, you know, a cystic lesion obstructing the bile duct? Is there a concern for malignancy, in which case you check K99? 
And then I just mentioned ERCP down here. Um, we typically don't use that in our run of the mill evaluation of pancreatic cysts. Uh, sometimes in the setting of main duct IPMNs, if they do, or we're concerned that there's the fish mouth, uh, which is, is, is typically seen with whole duct main IPMN, that side viewing ERCP scope will allow you to evaluate that. And sometimes we can actually either take a brushing of the duct or suction some of that fluid and then send that off like we would an FNA of a pancreatic cyst. So I guess the, the first main sort of differential breakdown is, is this benign or is this malignant? When looking at the, the benign fluid collections, there are those associated with acute inflammation, which we'll talk about uh, soon, uh, the most common of which is pseudocyst. And then there are these sort of more rare non-neoplastic uh, cysts, which we'll just briefly talk about in a few slides. Now, when it comes to the cysts with malignant potential, I sort of put uh, serous cyst adenoma in italics here. Uh, now, anyone who's done a little bit of reading on these cysts will probably question, I don't I've never read that those actually have malignant transformation. Um, they technically do. Um, to put their risk in perspective, all comers in the U.S., their risk of being pancreatic cancer is about 1%. What they'll quote in literature is for these cis, uh, serous cis adenomas to progress to cis adenocarcinomas, it's less than 3%. So it's like, you know, one and a half, two percent. So it's just above. It's so small that they don't. You know, if this is truly the diagnosis, they don't recommend continuing to follow them. However, technically, there is a pretty malignant risk, risk with them. Uh, the other uh, groups include the mucist, uh, mucinous cystic neoplasms (IPMNs), pseudopapillary neoplasms, and then cystic degeneration of sort of more solid tumors that grow just very large. And those include the neuroendocrine tumors and, and uh, your generic sort of adenocarcinoma. Uh, in regards to the, the inflammatory fluid collections, these are typically seen with pancreatitis. The two main breakdowns you want to see for this are, are time course, how long has pancreatitis been present, and um, is there a wall or not. Okay, typically um, at around four weeks, you'll typically form a wall. If it's pure fluid, it's a pseudocyst. If there's necrosis within there, it's, it's walled off necrosis. If individuals are very symptomatic before that four-week mark, uh, in which case there is not a great wall, typically IR or surgery needs to intervene uh, to, to drain these things if they're, for example, infected or causing uh, some other symptoms. After that four-week time, and, and it's a little bit different for everybody, and that can certainly be hashed out with imaging. So, for example, someone can have a wall three weeks. It's not unheard of, but typically we wait till about four weeks. But if there is a wall, then from our GI uh, perspective, we can actually intervene pretty safely, and that's essentially by draining these uh, collections. So in regards to pseudocysts, um, so again, most commonly due to acute or acute and chronic pancreatitis, um, or any situation that leads to disruption of the pancreatic duct. They're called pseudocysts because they lack an epithelial layer, uh, so that fluid is all an accumulation from some disruption of the pancreatic duct leaking into, uh, you know, a space next to the pancreas or within the pancreas. Uh, they can cause some sort of symptom, whether it's epigastric pain, whether it's symptoms of gastric outlet obstruction, where they get nausea, vomiting, poor PO intake, or they can be asymptomatic. Uh, so diagnosis, typically, uh, these are diagnosed, you know, in the appropriate setting, it's someone who comes in with, you know, epigastric pain, they're a drinker, they're lipases, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 30,000, and you get a CT scan, you see this big, large fluid collection. So the story pretty much makes a diagnosis in that situation. Uh, but again, sometimes it's not as clear as that. And, you know, certainly precancerous cystic lesions or even masses can lead to acute pancreatitis and then fluid collections forming. So in those situations, sometimes we will perform in the U.S. once the inflammation cools down a little bit to make sure that there isn't some other cause leading to that. And sometimes in those situations, we'll seal fluid from the what we think is a pseudocyst to figure out certainly what it is. Now, typically is one solid uniloculated collection. It has sort of a homogenous, uh, you know, nice wall. Um, they won't have septi loculations, anything that typically would occur um, with sort of your uh, precancerous uh, cystic lesions. Um, Fluid can, can vary, you know, it's either clear or it can look like muddy, bloody, brown stuff. It just looks very dirty, um, and it just depends. Uh, they will have increased amylase and lipase, obviously, because they're 
glycemic pancreatic secretions, um, then the CEA level will be low. And that's essentially a marker of mucin, which is seen more with uh, uh, precancerous cysts. This is actually just, uh, you know, whenever you say certain, um, you know, certain features are characteristic for one thing, you know, you'll always be proven wrong. So I never say like 100%, you know, then you're never going to have one thing or another. So this is a, a gentleman who's a acute and chronic um, pancreatitis patient over at hospital center I saw within the last month. As you can see around his large pseudocyst here, he's got a nice wall. He actually has calcifications within the wall, and he has a dilated PD on the backside, which you can see sort of coming up this area here. So he um, was very symptomatic from this uh, gastric bowel obstruction. I mean, you can basically see this is compressing all the organs in his abdomen. Uh, so we placed an axiosent to decompress him. I don't have his follow-up imaging. I saw him two weeks ago in clinic. He has yet to have that imaging. So it'd be cool to see exactly, you know, what it looks like now. It, I would hope it's resolved. Um, but just, uh, you know, typically... The endoscopic drain. Yeah. Yeah. So it just basically going from the stomach, so the stomach here basically, was, as you sort of come anteriorly, I basically just put it in this area here and then suction it out. Now, hit this wall is with the calcifications was like concrete. So the the catheter we use, it's not necessarily a, like a, a needle that we use for FNA. It's it's a little bit thicker. And it has a deployment system. We use it under cautery. Typically, it's thin enough with that cautery to certainly burn through any tissues that are there. With this, we actually just kept bouncing off of it. So it took like eight of these attempts before we actually got into the into this. So it was just like a very thick rind. Um, but if you were going to percutaneously drain this, like, I don't know, would there be any advantage to do it that way? The only, so I guess the main disadvantage is just having to have a drain there. So just the dealing with the bag, you know, depending on the sophistication of your patient and how well you think that they can handle that. You know, I mean, what's nice about this is it's all internal. Typically we put this in for about three to four weeks, re-image, ensure that that fluid collection has essentially closed down. And I'll have some pictures too to show you how, how nicely and quickly they, they do close down. You just go in there and you yank it right out. And then that cavity itself will just heal right up. So the benefit of endoscopic over IR or surgery is just, it's a little bit easier on the body. It can be, you know, we can do it as an outpatient as for sure. Um, the tr treatment of these it very much dependent on what your symptoms are. Historically, and what most of our textbooks will say are the rule of sixes. So is it greater than six centimeters? Has it been present for at least six weeks? If it is still big after the six weeks, you know, historically say, well, you've got to intervene on it with either IR or surgery or endoscopically. Uh, typically what we do is, is if they're symptomatic or not, okay? And typically that is based on size. So if they're big, they're going to be symptomatic, in which case, you know, it's going to probably take longer for them to resolve. So that's typically when we intervene. Uh, primarily, we use an axio stent, um, which I have a picture of here. Oh. Um, so essentially, it's a fully covered stent. looks like a little uh, dumbbell. And essentially, it's delivered with a cautery wire system. Uh, and basically, over time, as the lumen of this stent expands, these two ends of the dumbbell sort of compress, and it allows, um, you know, basically the inside wall of the pseudocyst to adhere to the stomach wall, and then you get a nice sort of formed fistula in that area. So then, theoretically, when you yank this bad boy out, there's no risk of just that fluid collection falling away and then leaking contents into the, into the belly. Uh, we can use pancreatic duct stents sometimes. Those are typically reserved for um, cysts that still communicate with the main pancreatic duct technically easier and safer to place that stent than doing this Axios just gets a little bit, you know, uh, can be a little bit more aggressive. In the past, IR and surgery were sort of the way to go, but with these being somewhat so easy to place and so safe to place, you know, we, we typically are using them uh, as our first line. So this is a, uh, a lady I saw about two and a half months ago at hospital center. She had a very bad uh, episode of acute pancreatitis that we thought was due to gallstones. She had two fluid collections, one a little bit more medially, medially uh, one a little bit more laterally. This is sort of looking at both of them in a sagittal view. Um, we did do an ERCV beforehand, so she's got a little stent that you can see here. Uh, and then you can see that she's got some calcified stones in her gallbladder over here. Uh, so what we attempted to do is place one axio stent first, see if it decompressed the whole system. I'm sort of wishful thinking. 
and we place this in this fluid collection right here. This is the stomach here that's compressed, so basically our scope would sit here. We use our EOS to find this fluid collection, and we delivered it right up here. Um, so this, you know, this image taken about a week later, so it's very nice resolution. She does have a little bit of like air within the uh, biliary tree here as a result. Um, however, the other collection didn't touch it, so it was still there. And you can see sort of the stomach compressed above this here. It's supposed to make its way all the way down over here. So we placed a second stent, uh, decompress that. And this image taken a couple day, days later showed persistence of this fluid collection. And it's likely because schmutz, whether they were eating or debris that was in here, couldn't make its way out. So essentially we went back in, uh, suctioned this stuff out of the way, actually drove the scope through here, and then suctioned the fluid out of here. Um, with pseudocysts, that's pretty easy because it's liquid. When you have walled off necrosis, it gets a little more challenging because it's more solid debris. Um, so there's a number of tools we can use. We have Roth net, uh, sort of bigger snares. There's this, uh, this little thing that's almost like an endo rotor rooter that we used on one guy. We did probably like 15 necrosectomies on him two years ago when I was a fellow. It's actually just a rotating shaver that we basically would use and we would just like shave the top and move our way down and we'd do him for about an hour, kept coming back just because his cavity was so big and he just had all this dead tissue in there. Um, fortunately, not many people need that. Um, so, and this is uh, basically her proximal stent, so the one we placed here. This is the inside of the cavity um, that we suctioned out. This is the more proximal one. The wall of that cavity is right here, so very well. That thing just closed down immediately. And then this is her most recent image, the beginning of uh, May. So you see, again, this collection is pretty much done. This one's done as well. We actually have her scheduled for an ERCP for a, a stent exchange, as well as yanking these out uh, next Monday. Uh, so the non-neoplastic pancreatic cysts, um, so the true cysts with epithelium lining the, the cyst cavity, all you need to know is that they are, they occur, okay? They're extremely rare. They're, these are like case reportable cysts. The true cyst has, uh, you know, a uh, cuboidal epithelium. I've never seen one myself. Um, so just know that they are retention cysts. Those are uh, dilated uh, side branches, usually in the setting of pancreatitis or CF. Uh, the thinking being that those uh, situations lead to sort of proteinaceous debris forming in the side ducts, which cause obstruction, and then you get these little cysts forming. Uh, there's this entity called mucinous non-neoplastic cysts um, that has sort of a mucin lining, but per the literature has no features of the cystic mucinous neoplasms. Um, and then the lymphoepithelial, which are basically lined with uh, squamous cells with a cellular uh, coating as well. But take home messages is know that they're sort of an entity, but they're so rare, you know, I've, I've certainly never seen them before. All right, so just, you know, getting into sort of the meat. So these uh, cystic neoplasms, again, we make a big deal because a certain number of them can progress. And we, you know, at this point, we're not very sophisticated in our ability, you know, other than basically following them every few months, taking fluid from them, performing MRCPs to see if they're growing or uh, developing any high-risk features. So with the serous adenoma, um, most commonly occurs in women increasing with age, located anywhere throughout the pancreas, most commonly in the pancreatic head. Um, like I said before, the malignant transformation is essentially that of the normal population. So typically if we do diagnosis, and we can based on just EOS features without even FNA or MRI or CT features, we essentially don't need to follow them. Uh, so the sort of the pathognomonic things you'll see is either a microcystic honeycomb or an olo oligocystic um, lesion with this central cellate scar that's calcified. I'm sure you have a picture of that. Um, I've only seen one of those in, in practice. Typically, it's you know, the, the appearance of these is very similar to, to that of you know either an IPMN or a mucinous plasm. So it gets the you know the overlap gets a little uh, difficult to tell. But if you're able to drain some fluid from this, you'll see uh, that the amylase and lipase are low and the CEA is low. Um, so here we see uh, an oligocystic lesion with a central stellate scar here, and then sort of more nicely on the path sample, you see sort of this uh, central area with this around it. 
So mucinous uh, cystic neoplasms, these are sort of a rare, usually unilocular, uh, again, seen more in women, increase with age, usually more distally located, so distal body and tail. Uh, sometimes we'll have symptoms, uh, but I got to tell you, you know, the literature will tell you that most of these people will have symptoms, and I don't think I've ever had someone with symptoms present. It's just the pseudocyst. And I, I would assume that that's a function of the imaging studies that we have now. So historically, people aren't getting scans for all the reasons that we do them for now. So these things are allowed to grow for decades on end, and then they present when they're sort of cats out of the bag. Now we're doing scans for, for anything. And as a result, you know, they get an MVA, we're doing a full body scan, and then we're finding these. And we're finding them when they're small, and it's before they're having any symptoms. Um, so again, main diagnosis with e -plus. So these, these can look like any of the other cysts. Basically what we want to see is that there's no high-risk features. You know, there's no associated nodules. They're not calcified. Um, the fluid itself, it's, uh, these are not going to be attached to the main ductal system like an IPMN. So amylase and lipase will be low, but they are mucinous, so the CEA will be high. You may also see these columnar epithelial cells uh, with ovarian type stroma. So that's pathognomonic for this. Again, I've never seen a, a sample come back with that. It'd be nice because then you would know, okay, this is for sure precancerous and then we can go from there. Usually they'll give you a little bit high or low amylase. The CEA will maybe be a little high, but then the cytology will not show that. Um, now, um, our knowledge of the risk of these is, is usually based on, um, you know, retrospective studies, and, and some say that the risk of higher risk stuff, higher, you know, uh, dysplasia, cancer can be as high as 10%. So historically, we've said that anyone that has what we think is this should go to surgery. Um, I think more commonly, or I guess more recently, we're seeing that the risk of these is quite low. Um, if there's nothing overtly wrong with the fluid, um, if they're not say more than three centimeters, we typically follow them. Again, though, you know, it's uh, you have this discussion with your patients, and they're like, okay, well, there's a small colon polyp in me, and you're not going to remove it, like a thing where we're just waiting for it to turn to cancer. So, depending on the fitness of you know your your patient for surgery, you sort of have to you know have that discussion with them. It's not as as clear cut. Um, this is just a sample here. So they, what they essentially did was do a distal pancreatectomy. Here's pancreas here. Here's the spleen. All right, IPMN. So this is the most common type of, of uh, precancer assist. Uh, common between uh, genders, typically occurring more with age. Um, the main subtypes are the branch type, which is most common. There's the main duct, and then there's a combination of the two. Main duct is the highest risk. Branch is the, le the, the least. Again, these, they'll say that these can cause symptoms, they'll cause pancreatitis, um, but very rare nowadays just because we're picking these up a lot sooner uh, before they can cause issues for individuals. Things to make you worry, older individuals, uh, are they causing symptoms, are they obstructing the, the bile duct, causing jaundice, are they causing new onset diabetes, which is a risk factor for adenocarcinoma? Are there any nodules or, or wall enhancements would, would, which would suggest transformation of this from sort of a pre malignant IPMN to something a little bit higher grade, say uh, dysplasia. So again, you know, diagnosis is started with imaging and then we sort of follow that up with EUS, getting fluid from whether it's, you know, the, the main cyst cavity or the, the duct itself. That we send off for uh, a number of different things. So similar to previous slides, we check usually the amylase, the CEA will also run mutation, mutational changes. Um, that will sort of spit out from an algorithm how high risk uh, this thing is. Uh, now just on a word on the guidelines. So um, historically, we knew that these were precancerous. As a result, we were basically re surgically resecting them. Um, so there was this consensus guideline created in 2006 basically looking at, okay, who truly is at risk? And you know, who needs to be resected and who can just be watched. And what essentially they found was we were resecting way too many people. You know, similar to doing, you know, PSAs and rectal exams, and you know, you're finding these people that probably were never going to have an issue, and then you're doing biopsies and radiation and causing all these things to, to individuals that probably didn't need it to begin with. So we wanted to 
have a little bit more sensitivity and specificity with who we were actually treating. And essentially what they came up with was that all MCNs, so the mucinous cystic neoplasms, or main duct IPMNs, um, as well as the branch duct with certain features, so symptoms, you know, a, a big main cyst, a mixed type, so, you know, um, having a somewhat dilated main duct or solid component, those would also be resected. But they said, you know, there's also this group that we can just follow. Unfortunately, what, what, what you know, occurred was the, the guidelines from this were based off of somewhat flawed data. It was all retrospective, um, and they found that the positive predictive value, the specificity was extremely low. It was like 30%. So they were like, no, well, we're still resecting way too many people. We probably don't need it. As a result, there was the next level of Fukuoka guidelines. So they divided people into sort of three risk categories. And again, these were not perfect. Um, certainly these characteristics you see here would suggest a higher risk lesion. They were able to get the positive predictive value at least for the high risk group uh, to about 60%, but still this worrisome group was about 29, which is very similar to the group they were sort of resecting in, in the last guidelines. So the latest iteration is the ACG guideline. And essentially, um, they're, they hedge their bets even further, and they're basically saying individuals that have high-risk features should undergo EUS, and based on those EUS characteristics and the high-risk features you're seeing on imaging, you should be referred to a multi-disc conference, and then the case is discussed. Um, and I have to tell you, a lot of these cases are, you know, it's, it's not as cut and dry. You know, the, our, our knowledge of these is, is ever growing and obviously the research within the field is, is growing so we can figure out what truly are the high risk fluid components that signify, um, you know, who's going to progress or not. And certainly, you know, we're, I'm, I know we're going to get better, but right now it's just, it's very difficult to tell because you might have someone who's 30 years old who has a very small lesion and they're like, you know what, like, I don't want to wait till I'm, 50 or 60 or 70 and I'm in poor health and then all of a sudden, you know, this thing's double or triple what it was and then, you know, having a surgery then is a lot harder. So, um, Wasting these guidelines for really no guidelines. Correct. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's difficult because a lot of these studies, especially the ones looking at the fluid analyses, like these are things that were created within the last five years. So, like, our long-term data just aren't there yet, unfortunately. Um, so this from the ACG guidelines, and I'll sort of show you. So you're you're basically looking, what are the high-risk features, and some of which we've already talked about. So are people symptomatic? Do they have a history of pancreatitis, which would suggest that this is probably more a pseudocyst or benign? And um, and then also, you know, what 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 is the size of this? And you know, at some point you're going to get a, an EUS and FNA, and you know, pretty much it's going to be you know, refer to a multi-disc group, MRI. No further reaction, uh, an MRI. So um, you know, there's, there's not much there's not much of a clear cut guideline there. It's, it's basically like, all right, just go to a group of people who are experts in that area, and have them discuss it out. So it's it's very much a bet hedge. And then uh, the intervals of following the in, at least the ones you think are the precancers, so mucinous or IPMN, is based on size. So less than a centimeter. MRI every two years, and then increasing size, you get a little bit more, uh, you know, frequent with your um, findings. I would say in practice, we're probably a little bit more aggressive with these, um, and a lot of times that's just because patients are very worried. You know, they're like, "Whoa, you're going to have me do an MRI in two years?" Like, no, I want to like, I want something out, like do an EUS now. So typically, at least for the first year or two, we'll be a little bit more aggressive, maybe every six months. Then if we can ensure there is stability of the lesions, it's not growing, there's no new features, they're not symptomatic, then we can sort of convince them that probably we don't need to be doing this as frequent. So solid pseudopapillary neoplasms, so these are a less common type. Typically it's going to be a young girl. They're going to present, these will present with pain almost every single time. Um, and um, they're usually in like their 20s or 30s. And it's very interesting that I had one of these present uh, end of April, a uh, young girl just graduated from college, applying to med school, developed abdominal pain. So initially it was described as pelvic. Uh, she had like a full pelvic workup. Then I'm getting a CT scan after the pelvic ultrasound was negative. And then she had this 
lesion in her pancreatic tail. Um, no family history, you know, no significant drinking or smoking to suggest this is, you know, pancreatitis uh, derived. Um, let me just see if I can. So this is her EUS here, and unfortunately you can't see it that well, but it is called a cystic neoplasm, but typically these are going to be solid lesions. They're very subtle too. So you sort of just have to trust me when I tell you what you're looking at. So this is the left kidney. This usually on our EOS will mark the junction between the, the body and tail of the pancreas. So the tail is going to come out this way, uh, the body's this way. So this is her lesion here. And after you look at about a thousand of these, then you can find that pretty easily. But when you're starting out, this looks just like the rest of the gland itself. If you were to hand me this person without knowing what her history is or what previously had been found, it'd be very tricky to find this area. But when you know what you're looking for, and when your imaging is good enough, then you, you know, it sort of provides you with a little evidence. Just another picture here of it. So um, these can have cystic degeneration and become a, a cystic leak. But typically, that's not until they're super large. But again, we sort of figured these out pretty soon. So this is her CT scan here, and you can see this well encapsulated sort of circumscribed lesion right here in the tail, right? Sort of in the mid body. Right? Yeah. So what we did, it's difficult to know exactly where. So the pank, the bottom of the kidneys here. So as the stomach, which I think is right here, as you come sort of superiorly, you're able to see basically I traced the tail, saw the pancreas, and then saw this area here. And I believe she's actually undergoing resection today at Hopkins. Um, but again, so the, that Patrick Jackson does this kind of stuff. He does, yeah. So I did. I ended up doing her at, at hospital center. So I referred her to the guys over there. She was going to see them, and then became one of those friend of the family. And then she saw them for a second opinion. And yeah. <laughs> um, now these um, these can be a little bit more risky. Um, the data for their aggressive behavior is, is based on just retrospective studies and essentially up to 10% of people will have either severe dysplasia or cancer. Um, time will tell truly if, if that's you know truly how risky these are. Because that's sort of our baseline, uh, we essentially resect all these. Now again, these typically occur in the tail. It's pretty easy to do a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy as opposed to a full-on Whipple in, say, a 23-year-old girl who's trying to, you know, graduate from college and apply to med school. So, um, you know, it's in a more amenable, easy location. You can almost, you know, this can be robotic now, minimally invasive, so it's, uh, you know, for what that's worth. All right. And then after these are resected, so unlike, um, you know, cancer, we really need to follow these. Typically, we'll just follow them every year with EUS or imaging. Um, just make sure nothing regoes. Their recurrence rate is essentially zero, though. Okay. In the last group, so just to be aware, if you see a cystic lesion, um, and usually this is going to be sort of a more complex lesion. You're not just going to see one little circumscribed fluid collection. This is going to have solid components, mirror nodules and such. That's when you have to be concerned that, you know, is this adenocarcinoma with a cystic degeneration, is this a neuroendocrine, which typically, you know, when we'll do an FNA of this, we're going to basically suction out a lot of that fluid, send that off, but we're also going to get a lot of tissue from that, which will then allow us to uh, make that diagnosis. All right. So with all that being thrown at you, what, uh, what questions do you have? What happens to these patients who get you know, these IPMs that are not in the ordinary care, tertiary care center? If you're like in a rural area, it's kind of hard to get a multidisciplinary yeah. team together. And yeah, no, that's that, yeah. that's a good point. And, you know, part of the management of these is being able to sort of get out and educate, you know, GI and actually primary care in those, in those areas. So typically, if they're small, you know, it can be as simple as doing MRIs every couple of years. Um, you know, maybe drag them into the city to do an EUS just to be able to take some fluid and just show that there's not anything high risk in there. Yeah. Um, but that is a challenge. Um, and you know, typically for your private practice GI group, they most of them won't do endoscopic ultrasound. It's just a, a 
uh, endeavor to get all the equipment and you have to have pathology labs and also you need surgeons to refer these people to. You're not, you're not going to just do all this stuff and then like diagnose them with something high risk and be like, well, I don't, I don't know where you go from here, but sorry, this is high risk. So, yeah. you know, a lot of, a lot of our referral base is just, you know, individuals that don't see this that often. And as a result, it, it sort of comes to us here. But typically just follow. And, and what I tell individuals is, you know, our knowledge of this is not the best right now. It's getting better. We will plan like you'll, we'll be very good friends for the next five years. We'll be getting you in pretty frequently, alternating between ideally an MRI and an EUS. And then after that time period, we'll sort of have a discussion on how aggressive we need to get. And certainly there, a number of factors come into play. And you know, what's their family history? How healthy they are? What are their other comorbid conditions? Where is it located? If it's located in the tail, maybe we bite the bullet and get it out. If it's in the head, that just automatically makes things more complicated because it means the whipple and that's just not the easiest tolerated of procedures. So. Um, they have looked at ablative techniques, so basically injecting alcohol into these things. It doesn't work. You give people pancreatitis. So that, that by no means is mainstream. So it's just like you create another issue for them by, by doing that. But, you know, they are looking at, like, injecting chemotherapeutic agents. Into the tricky thing is it's certainly with the IPMNs. Those are theoretically connected to the main pancreatic duct. So, like, you could be shooting that. It gets in everywhere and then, then causes issues throughout the gland. So it's just... Um, that by no means is, is mainstream yet, but, uh, you know, something they're looking at. And then would you ever have um, any, like, mass-like lesion and have it be, like, autoimmune pancreatitis, like an IgG4? Yeah. Th yeah. Those those typically are very subtle masses. Um, right. I, you know, I, I see a bunch of that, but I don't see a lot of the pancreas ones. Mm -hmm. But... I don't remember seeing like mass lesions in the pancreas with that. With with autoimmune? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very rare. It's it's a, it's a rare entity to begin with. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, the people will have sort of the sausage shaped, sort of thickened um, sort of whole gland itself. I have one lady that has actually bless you, has an actual mass there. Mm -hmm. um, it was like concrete trying to FNA it. It was just hard as heck, fibrous, calcified. Um, every time we tried to hit it with a needle, it was just like bouncing away from us, but we were able to diagnose it. So uh, sent her over to the surgeons. They took a look at her. We actually have her on steroids right now. We're going to repeat imaging and then sort of see what happens with it. But, <laughs> full, full, see, she's, she's uh, debatable whether she's symptomatic from this. Uh, her symptoms are a little bit nonspecific, so um, really we'll – yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see uh, we'll see how that all all shakes out. But and then what about neuroendocrine tumors that might be in the pancreas? Like, do you ever see that? We do. Um, typically, they're going to be very well circumscribed. So adenocarcinomas are going to be irregular. They're just going to be hypochoic. They're going to look worse. Um, whereas you know things like the papillary tumor, neuroendocrine, they're very well circumscribed. They're very easy to see. So that sort of will hint you to, to that being the case. Um, so we see them every once in a while, um, depending on the location. They'll be soft. They won't be cystic. Yet. Not that not that I've seen so far. Theoretically, they can if they get very large. Um, what I've seen in practice, there's only been a handful, and typically they're well circumscribed. And, and depending on their location, I think I had one that was sort of a budding. This is a guy I did about a month ago. It's essentially a bud. It's in sort of the neck region here, a budding the bile duct. So what we did was I put a stent in the bile duct just to sort of protect that. And then one of the surgeons at hospital center actually just did an enucleation and just removed this little area and preventing him from getting a, a whipple. So he was actually seen in another location was, didn't even get in the U.S., but was told he has this and was told to get a whipple. Um, came for a second opinion. We got tissue from it, proved that it truly was what it was, but he got, you know, a far less taxing procedure and he's doing fine, so. I don't know if you guys have ever seen someone after Whipple. Back in that yeah. generally miserable. Yeah. Yeah, and of course we, we like somewhat have this selection what? bias. Yeah. We see all the when it comes to like bariatric surgeries and whipples, we see all the, the train wrecks after. So I would hope that that's not sort of the norm for everyone. But it's a it's a difficult procedure. You're yeah. you're ripping
breaking them apart and reconnecting all these delicate things like the pancreas. So, you know, the immediate post-op is complicated. The long-term issues are, are complicated. So that's why, unfortunately, we don't just say take all these cysts out. You know, it's just it's, it's a difficult area to, to work in. So most of these people will be fine. This isn't going to be something that's going to ultimately lead to their demise. It's probably going to be their blood pressure, their cardiac disease, and all those other things. But, you know, we just need to keep an eye on these and figure out who is that small percentage of people that are going to progress. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I know just from my time here, many of patients who have incidental IPMN findings, and it's a good way to know how to yeah. advise patients and families. Yeah. Now you have to get the you have to get the renal cysts and the adrenal cysts to take care of those too. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, like two minutes. Not quite. I mean, it's sometimes you know, uh, you know, the, the pancreas is or I'm sorry, the uh, the left kidney is usually going to be in this area, and sometimes it's very difficult to tell whether your cyst is coming off the pancreas or coming off the whether it's the pancreas or the kidney, especially when they're when they're so big. So yeah. those can so, sometimes be a little nerve wracking as you're trying to pick out what's arising from what in that area, but we're not we're not doing anything about those just yet, but <laughs> in the future maybe. All right. So eventually aren't you guys supposed to be doing like uh you know like remove appendices and other <laughs> <things>. <laughs> so take away all the jobs. So, so it, yeah. It's medicine is is funny in that different fields sort of in cringe and or infringe on other other groups and you know surgeons or IR will do things that we do so um, we can essentially do what's called a full thickness resection so we can if someone has you know appendicitis for example there is a basically an attachment to the scope where we can suction it depends on the anatomy too we can suction that into this cap we place this full thickness essentially it's like a bear trap it basically closes around the back side and then we snare the top off. Um, so you can do that for a number of things. Carcinoid tumors or neuroendocrine of the stomach that are a little bit bigger or a little bit deeper. Other things like small gifts, we can do that. Um, so that's something we don't necessarily do here yet, um, but many places are doing it and getting pretty good at it. Um, there's a lot of interventional EUS stuff we can do. People are, you know, taking portal pressure measurements, they're sticking catheters in portal veins, they're doing lung biopsies, liver biopsies, doing biopsies like for, for individuals that would need um, like a transjugular biopsy for cirrhosis to figure out what, just do that from the stomach. So there's a lot of sort of very cool cutting edge stuff that's that's coming up. thoracic, like lymph nodes. Yep. Yeah. So we don't do too much of that here just yet, but it's one of those things where once you start doing it and you have a good working relationship with surgeons, for example, and, and you can prove that it's safe and people are having pretty good outcomes, it's something that you can, you know, in the right clinical context, you can do going forward. So, yeah, so it's our way to sort of push back. <laughs> but on the flip side, so like IR now can basically, instead of just putting their internal external drain, they can actually put catheters, they can balloon dilate the ampulla, they can put just internalized stents there, they can push stones out. So it's, you know, it's it's good to have all these things, you know, it's, they'll sort of infringe on your territory a little bit, but in a lot of cases, if you can't get to it from your end, you're glad you have them there to, to do it from there. So everyone's, everyone's sort of adopting new techniques and sort of doing things that other groups have done, and it's, you know, sometimes a lot safer. So putting our axio stents in, that's way better than someone having a surgical necrosectomy and drains and internal external stuff. It's just this allows us to put it in, person goes home in an hour. Yeah. 